Well, I believe we have some good things to share with you tonight. Let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 5. And uh, I'll tell you right up front, we won't get through this chapter tonight. Uh, there's just so much there. And, uh, but you'll remember that I made this statement a couple of times uh, over the course of this teaching that uh, very often when Galatians is taught on, uh, it's taught from the standpoint of law and grace, and that certainly is there. It's, it's in the, the, the teaching. But uh, Paul, more often than not, refers to freedom and bondage, and he refers to a false gospel and a true gospel. All right? And he says over and over again that if you believe the false gospel, it brings you into bondage, that you have to stick with the true gospel. And he uses the context of law and grace because the Judaizers were attempting to bring these Galatian believers back under the law of works. And by doing so, they were going to be brought into bondage. So Paul didn't have anything bad to say about the law. When he talks about the law here, he's talking about the bondage of the works of the law. All right. Uh, because Paul said himself in the book of Romans, that, or excuse me, in the pastoral epistles, he said the law is good and just and holy and perfect if a man use it lawfully. All right? But in Galatians, he references more often than anything freedom and bondage and a false gospel and a true gospel. And we ended last Wednesday uh, with verse 31 of chapter 4. So then, brethren, we're not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And then he makes this statement and starting off in chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, So stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now it's very interesting because the Greek uh, order of this sentence is, And not again in a yoke of slavery be held. And not again in a yoke of slavery be held. The Amplified Bible says, uh, which you once removed, a yoke which you once removed. Now, in the Roman Empire, it's very interesting that Paul would use this phrase because in the Roman Empire, the slave was basically property that could be sold. They had no rights. Uh, they were just, they were treated like a common, a common piece of property, a common animal. And he writes to the Galatian believers that had received freedom through Jesus Christ and now are, are being tempted to come back under this yoke of bondage. And he says, and not again in a yoke of slavery be held. He uses this analogy for a reason, to explain the real meaning of what would happen if they listened to these false teachers. You're, you're not, you're, listen, you're, you're not going to gain anything, he's saying. You're going to come into a far worse spiritual bondage than you had before. All right? So important. Then in verse 2, he says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now, this is important. Because Paul lets them know right here, look, the law is an all or nothing proposition. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you try to keep part of the law and you don't keep it all, you're guilty of it all. And he's saying they're trying to, to get you to believe that this, this physical work of circumcision, that it is needful for your salvation. And he said, but I'm telling you, that's part of the work of the law. And if you try to do part of it, and you don't do all of it, you're a debtor for all of it. And he inserts his apostolic authority here, and he says, look, I'm Paul. I'm telling you this. I'm the one that brought you the gospel. I'm the apostle of that church. I brought you the gospel. I shared the truth with you, and I wouldn't lie to you. I'm telling you that if you try to keep part of it, and you don't keep it all, you're guilty of it all. Yes, Amen. The Woos Bible says, Behold, I, Paul, am saying to you that if you persist in being circumcised, Christ will be advantageous to you in not even one thing. Because you're, you're, you're substituting the freedom that you found in Christ for a law of works and you lose all the advantages of being in Christ. 
This is important. We'll get into this further as we go. Anytime you start adding something to the gospel of by grace through faith, then you're losing the advantage of freedom of being in Christ. That, that, that's, that's why I believe, listen, I believe the biggest problem you have in churches is people don't know who they are in Christ. That's the biggest problem you have. That's the answer to sin. That's the answer to recurring problems. That's the answer is knowing who you are in Christ. And Paul says he's advantageous to you in not even one thing. And I solemnly affirm to every man who receives circumcision or this work of the flesh that he's under obligation to do the whole law. Why? Because you can't, you, you could not, under law, you couldn't keep part of it and not keep all of it. What was Jesus' problem with the religious leaders? Why do you call them hypocrites? Because you do this part of the law and you don't do this part of the law. And he wrote in Matthew 6, he said, If your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom. You, you understand? And, and Paul's dealing with the same thing. These guys are painting a pretty picture for you and saying if you listen to us and you add this, then you're going to get some deeper revelation. He's saying, but I'm telling you that if you enter into that, you'll lose even what you have. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Then in verse 4 he says, Christ is become no effect unto you whatsoever of you who, uh, of you are Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Notice this, you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit, notice this, wait for the hope of righteousness, notice these two words, by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now Paul uses a very strong term here. He says you're fallen from grace. Those of you that want to be justified by law, you're fallen from grace. That word means totally cut off from Christ. That's important. Because he says you're seeking to be justified by the law and you're separating yourself from Christ. See, we're, we're going to talk about faith in just a moment. Faith cannot be mixed with works, and works cannot be mixed with faith. I know James talks about Abraham was justified by his works, but they were works of faith. Works in faith of what God said. They weren't works to produce faith or to prove faith. Works do not prove faith, because there are people that work and claim to be in faith, and it doesn't work, yes, sir. because it was just works. Faith without works is dead. In other words, faith can't get into a situation without works, but works don't produce faith. Amen. They had absolutely no hope of salvation. If you want to be justified by the law, you're taught, cut off from Christ. Why? Because, because the, whole th the whole issue with redemption was you did nothing to receive it. except receive it. Amen? It's a free gift. And then he states again, notice that true righteousness comes only by faith. You are only righteous by faith. The Bible says not by works of righteousness that you have done, but by the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, you were made righteous. Yes, sir. Amen? That's so important. Be because, listen... Everything that Jesus Christ did, everything that he, everything that we are, he did. Everything he did was for us. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Do, do you understand that? Yes, Jesus came to this earth and he lived a sinless life. Amen. Kept the law perfectly. Why? So you wouldn't have to, for you, for you, live sinless for you, kept the law for you, perfectly pleased the Father for you, went to the cross and died for you, yes, went to hell for you, yes. rose from the dead for you, you, and the Bible says He's seated at the right hand of the Father 
ever making intercession for you. Everything he did was for you. And, and it's not just for you as a benefit. It was for you so you wouldn't have to do it. I could never have perfectly pleased the Father. He did it for me. I could not live sinless. He did it for me. I could not die for my own sin. He did it for me. I couldn't go to hell for my own self. He did it for me. And Paul's saying, if you're trying to do it for yourself, you're losing all those advantages. You're losing all of them. Amen. And, and, and that's the problem. Whenever you hear someone talking and they say, well, you know, I just need to try to do better. Doing better is not the issue. Trying to do better is not the issue. It's believing in what's already been done for you. Amen. Because mark it down, write it down. You're going to miss it. You're, you're going you're to color outside the lines at some point. But somebody kept perfectly within the lines for you. And this is, what, this is what flabbergasted Paul, if we can use that word, is that you people, you were Gentiles, you were, not, you were strangers, you were aliens from God, you had no covenant with God, and you heard the gospel and gave your life to Jesus, and it was by grace, through faith, and now I don't understand why you want to go back under the works of the law and lose all these advantages that Jesus bought for you. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I've been, I'll just tell it, I'll, the Holy Spirit said to say it, so I'll say it. I've been accused of giving people a license to sin. Well, first of all, people don't need a license to sin. They sin without one. Amen. But what I, what I, when I teach along these lines, I'm giving you power over sin. Because you receive power over sin when you see how righteous and holy you are in Christ. Amen. You start adding something to it, I just got to try harder, I got to do a little bit more, then you're walking away from the advantages that you have by being in Christ. Amen. It's like the story the guy told, uh, he was on, a, on a, a television show, and this was way back in the 70s, and so you'll understand my terminology, and he was, he was on there with the head of the women's liberation movement. Y'all remember the women's liberation movement? Women liber, right? And, uh, and he was in the green room when she came in. And, and when she came in, he stood up and she said, you sit down. And of course, uh, I, for the sake of time, he said, ma'am, he said, my ancestors would come up out of the ground and get me if they knew I didn't stand up for a woman. And he said, I just want to know, he said, what women are you trying to liberate? And she said, every woman. We want to liberate him. He said, well, let me tell you about me and Mama. He said, uh, you know, he said, uh, every day, Mama sleeps in till she wants to get up. And when she gets up, she can have breakfast, and she can have it anywhere she wants to, in bed, on the couch, in the kitchen, or on the patio. He said, because I got a woman hired that comes in every day and takes care of Mama. Right? And he said when she gets done eating, if she wants to, she can get cleaned up and go to the hair salon. And he said, and she goes in, goes to the hair salon in a brand new gold Lincoln Continental. And he said, now, Miss Women Liber, Mama don't want you messing with the deal she's got. Amen? Right? I don't want anybody messing with the advantages that I've got with Christ. Amen? And, and, and the way that, that, that Paul says here, he says you are, you are losing your advantages because in Christ is where you received them. And you're fallen from grace, totally cut off by trying to do these works. And then he states again, notice that righteousness comes only by faith. And he states that in Christ, notice in Christ, these works of the flesh, circumcision or uncircumcision, mean nothing. It's faith that works by love. The Roos Bible says, faith coming to effective expression through love. 
Amen. Amen. Faith cannot be effective through works. It, it, it just cannot. It's effective or evidence through love that's put in daily action. Jesus said that love was the fulfilling of the law. Jesus said it. Paul said it twice. Romans chapter 13, he says it here. That the law is fulfilled in these words. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul says the work of faith is love. That's right. Amen. When you love your neighbor as yourself, that's faith. And he says it's expressed through love. Hallelujah. So faith can't be effective through works. Then in verse 7, he says, You did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? That word hinder means who cut in on your lane or who cut you off. And it carries the analogy from running a race. You know, in, in, in the 100 meters and a sprint race, uh, uh, that's a sprint, the 440, the 220, the 100 meters, you're not allowed to get out of your lane because you're not allowed to impede the progress of the runner in the lane next to you. Even in the distance races, 1,500 meters, mile, other 1,200, you've got to stay in the same lane for the first lap. And after everybody crosses, comes around on the first lap, then they ring a bell and then you can get out of your lane. Because you're not allowed to impede the progress of the person next to you. And Paul says, man, you were really running well. Who cut into your lane and cut you off? Notice that. You were born again. You were full of the Holy Ghost. You were, you were living this life in Christ. Who have you allowed to cut you off? Think about that sometimes. The freedom you have in Christ... You never want to allow anybody to cut you off and hinder you from walking in it. Amen. Then he says, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. This is so important. Because he says here, the Amplified Bible says, A little leaven, a slight inclination to error, or a few false teachers. Now you read that, and then you've got to ask yourself, so how is it that people can say, it doesn't matter who you listen to? It does matter. It matters. I've had, I've had people say things like, well, you're not the only person that we can listen to. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm absolutely not. There are plenty of other good preachers that you ought to listen to. But they ought to, they ought to agree with what you believe theologically and what you're taught in your local church. Amen. You don't go to the TV to see if we're teaching right. That's right. That's you right. judge what's being said on the TV by what you're hearing week to week. Absolutely. This is where you get fed. That's right. That's right. And, 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 and if, it's, if, if you're watching online, this isn't your church. Whoever your pastor is, that's who you judge other teachings by. And Paul says the leaven, according to the Amplified, is a, a, a slight inclination to error or a few false teachers. Mm -hmm. Amen. I remember I was talking with a guy one time, close friend of mine, and he was talking to me about how he always listened to this minister, and he made, mentioned his name, and I'd heard this minister talk about how, you know, speaking in tongues wasn't for us and, and, uh, and, and didn't believe in the moving of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and all these different things. And I'm sitting there thinking, why would a full gospel, Pentecostal, filled with the Holy Ghost, tongue-talking believer listen to that? And people will say, well, you know, and they'll quote Brother Hagin. And I've said it, and it's right. Well, you've got to be smart enough to spit out the sticks and, and swallow the hay. And Charles Capp said, that's a good statement. He said, but I had a horse one time that wasn't smart enough to spit out the sticks. And he got a stick hung in his throat, and we had to call the vet. Everybody is not smart enough or mature enough to spit out the sticks. That's right. And why do you want to risk eating sticks? <laughs> See, Paul's saying, look, guys, he said, you're entering into something and leaven leavens the whole lump. If you start listening to a little false teaching, it's going to get into everything you do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Amen. You ought to turn off. I'm just going to tell you straight. You ought to turn off anybody that, is, that will tell you they're not sure if it's God's will to heal you every time. You shouldn't listen to it at all. You should turn it off. Yeah, but I like his style. Yeah, but it's a little leaven. Here, I have a question. I have a question. So, I've told you the brownie story, right? With the little cow manure and the brownies. Right? And, and I bring you a plate of brownies and they're hot and they're... Now, nah, I don't eat brownies, but you know, it's a good analogy. And I tell you all it's got in it. Oh, it's sweet and chocolate and all this stuff. And you're about to take one and take a bite and I go, oh, oh, hang on. And a little cow manure. I mean, not much. I mean, just a pinch. And we don't even know where it's at. Chances are the brownie you're about to eat will not even have it in it. I've never had anybody tell me they would take a brownie. Why? Because what, what do you think? If it's in the bowl, chances are it's in my brownie. Right? If, if someone will say it's not God's will to heal you all the time, it's just like that. I can't trust any of it. Right? You just can't trust it. And Paul says, look, you think you're just getting in on a little, uh, 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 a little extra something, but it's, listen, you got to do the whole thing. Right? And he goes on and he says, uh, a few false teachers covers the whole batch. It perverts the concept of faith and it misleads the church. It perverts the concept of faith and misleads the church. Just a little bit. Yeah, but I knew so and so and, and you know, they were sick and they were believing God and they didn't get healed. Doesn't change what the Word says. It does not change what the Word says. Doesn't change it. Right? Because you can't start changing your doctrine because of somebody's experience. Well, I knew so-and-so, and, -so and they, they, they tried that giving and receiving, and they didn't receive anything. Or I tried that giving and receiving, and I didn't receive anything. What you're saying is that the Bible's wrong. It's what you're saying. Amen. But, I, but I've had people say, well, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> User error, I guess. Be, because uh, I don't know what to tell you. Because, right? People say, well, I, I tried that faith stuff and it didn't work. No, they're wrong. That faith stuff tried them. And, and they didn't measure up. When you, Faith is simply this. When you see something in the Word, that's it. It's in the Word. It's mine. It's truth. Am I helping you with this? Told you I wouldn't get through this chapter. <laughs> Amen. I have confidence in you, verse 11, uh, 10, through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever it may be. And I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why am I suffering persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So there were people going around saying, well, Paul's preaching works. And Paul said, if I'm preaching works, why are they persecuting me? In other words, he's saying this, I'm not, that's not what I'm doing. All right? Then he says, for all the, uh, for, uh, verse 13, For brethren, you've been called to liberty. Only don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. Now that can be used in the context of living after the flesh, and he talks about that later on. But he's saying, don't use your freedom of choice as an opportunity to go back under the works of the flesh. Right. Stay where you're at. Notice what he says. He says, uh, by love, serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, love your neighbor as yourself. So he's saying, if you're walking in love, you're fulfilling the law. You don't have to do a work. You don't have to observe a feast day. You don't have to observe Sabbath or eat a certain food. When you love each other, you fulfilled the law. Amen. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed. Wow. 
that you be not consumed one of another. Then he says, this I say then. In light of that, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. When he said, uses the word walking in the Spirit, it is uh, very closely related to this term, strolling in the Spirit. In other words, it's a comfortable pace. It's something you're in the habit of doing. You, 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 you've been there for so long, you're comfortable there. It's like walking through your house. If you've lived in your house long enough, chances are you don't even have to turn the lights on. You, you know where things are because they've been there long enough. You can, right? In most cases. But here's the point. Strolling in the Spirit. It's a place that we should be very comfortable in. In the Spirit. And he's emphasizing the ongoing role of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. And he says something here. He says, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill... The lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now this is not like religion says, oh the flesh is so strong and it's a constant fight and it's a constant this. No, it's saying the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit are contrary to each other. Right? And he says they are contrary one to another. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. Right? And he, and he says, here's, here's the issue. It's, it's the flesh and the spirit. But he said, if you are led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. The word for works here means some kind of action or deed or activity. It could refer to a person's job or occupation or the things produced by a person's effort in life. So he says the works, the actions, the deeds, the activities of the flesh. And then he says they're manifest. They're manifest. He connects this to the flesh. He's saying if the flesh is allowed to have its way and do what it wants, it'll work very hard to produce fleshly results. All right? Understand that. Understand something. That you, that's why you got to understand the tripartiteness of man, the three parts of man. Because you, the spirit, the real you, is sanctified, holy, just, righteous, and forgiven. Your flesh is not sanctified. you got to keep it under. That's a good place to say amen. I am in charge of whether my flesh stays sanctified. Right? I have to keep it under. By what? By bringing it under the control of the Spirit. Amen. And he says something. If the flesh is allowed to have its way and do what it wants, it'll work very hard to produce fleshly results. When the flesh is not submitted to the power of the Holy Spirit, it will work around the clock that will produce fruit that is hurtful, that is damaging, that is deadly. And notice, what's this a warning? You're going back under the works of the flesh. You're going back under the works of the law and you're going to be subject to the flesh. And it won't be long. All these things will be manifesting in your life. Isn't that what Paul said in Romans 7? He said, before I was born again, I was under the law. Right? right. And he said, I didn't know adultery was wrong, except the law said you shall not commit adultery. Yeah. And then what did he say about his experience under the law? The things I wanted to do, I couldn't do. And what I didn't want to do, that's what I did. And he said, under the law, I said, wretched man that I am. Who will free me from the bondage of this death? And the ver very next verse says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In Christ. That's why Romans 8, 1 says, There's therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. Right? 
So Paul's telling the Galatian believers, you're going to lose the power over the flesh that you have. You're going to lose the power over sin that you have. You're going to lose the advantages of being in Christ. And this is what's going to happen. Your flesh is going to start working. The law empowers flesh. Understand that. Paul, Paul said that. He said the law empowers flesh. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Amen. Glory to God. And then he said, this is the occupation of the flesh. The flesh is sinful craving and impulses. In other words, the flesh has a mind of its own. And if we don't crucify the flesh and keep it under, it'll eventually manifest those evil desires. Amen. Do you see this? The flesh is so base and carnal that if we don't stop its activity, it'll try to lead us into the works that are listed here. It's important. Because, listen, when a baby's born into this world, they're pure and innocent. So pure, so innocent. All right? But notice something. If that child's left and abandoned to the control of their flesh, they'll end up producing the fruit of the flesh. Amen. Amen. It's important that we train ourselves to mortify the deeds of the flesh. See, what Paul's saying is, you come back under here, under the works of the law, and living in the flesh, you're going to come under the bondage of the flesh. You, you can't mortify the flesh trying to please God in the flesh or with flesh. Amen. A life dominated by the flesh is a hard life. A life filled with excess. Imbalance. Laziness. Amen. Hatred, self-abuse, strife, bitterness, you name it. That, that's, that's what a life filled with irresponsibility, neglect. Amen. You, you've said this about people, I know. You've looked at them and said, my Lord, they're the same age as me, but they look, they look like they're twice my age. They must have led a hard life. They led a life after the flesh. Amen. I've seen people get born again before, and, and they, they, they might be a, a, a young person, you know, in their 30s, late 20s, 30s, and they look 10, 12, 15 years older than that, and they get born again, and in a matter of weeks, they look younger because they're no longer living after the flesh. They're living after the Spirit, and Jesus said the Spirit gives life. Am I helping you? The way of the flesh is the hardest route for any person to take. But the flesh screams to be in charge. Think about that. You know, a, a little child has not learned to control their desires. And so if, if you go to sit down and turn the TV on and they're in the room, I want to watch this, I want to watch this, I want, I want to watch, I want, I want, I want. And if you go, now, no, we're not going to watch that right now. We're going to watch this right now. Eh, eh. It's not that they're bad, a bad child. or It's just that's the way the flesh is. And so that flesh has to be brought under control. Right? But the flesh screams to be in charge. Say, say, say that out loud. The flesh screams to be in charge. Amen. To have its own way. And we got to take the flesh to the cross and crucify it by the power of God. Amen. Or what? It'll keep screaming until we finally give in. Amen. And finally surrender and allow it to produce its fruit in our lives. But Paul said, if we live in the Spirit, make the Spirit our habitation. We can guarantee that we won't allow the flesh to fulfill its desires. I've had people ask me, well, why did so-and-so mess up? Why did they fall? Living in the flesh. It's real simple. I've had people say, well, anybody can fall. No, they can't. 
Anybody can, but not everybody will. Because there are those of us that are going to live in the Spirit. Amen? Amen? I told one group of people one time, I said, I'm not going to hell for any of y'all. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to get over and live in the flesh and risk going to hell. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep the flesh under. Amen. So are you. So our goal should be to walk in the Spirit and develop our human spirits to become more sensitive to the Spirit of God. Because when I'm spiritually sensitive, it's easier to stay in line with the Holy Spirit. I got to be spiritually sensitive. When walking in the Spirit becomes a habit, we'll deny our flesh. Amen. And we'll deny it for so long that it'll get weaker and weaker until it finally has no more authority in our life. Now Paul goes on, he says, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And if we get them, we get them. If we don't, well, we'll be back again. But he starts off with, the King James uses two words, adultery and then fornication. In the Greek, it's actually only one word, fornication. Now, fornication is basically this, any sexual activity outside of marriage. Any. All right? I, I had a guy argue with me one time about it, but, you know, I've, either way, uh, the, it's one word. The, the King James translators use adultery and fornication, but it's one word, fornication. It's, it's the Greek word pornea. It's where the word pornography comes from, and it basically means any sexual activity outside of marriage. So we live in a society that uses the term, well, you know, I don't want to go too far. We can do this as long as we don't do this. Any sexual activity outside of marriage, God considers it fornication, and he says it's a work of the flesh. And it will eventually bring death. I'll jump to the end of this. We'll, we'll go through these, but I'll, I'll jump to the end. He said, he said that I have told you before that they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's important. It's important. You know, this is, this is considered clothesline preaching nowadays, but it's still important. Amen. Because, because I've, got to keep, I've got to keep this in mind. If I start giving the flesh a little bit here and there, right, he's going to take over. Amen. And so this is, again, varying degrees of sexual immorality. That's all it can mean. All right. Then... He says, uncleanness. Now, this is uh, indulging in other forms of immorality or a misuse of sex. So this would include homosexuality, uh, transgenderism, uh, all of these things that they're trying to make normal nowadays. The Bible says it's uncleanness. You know, twice in the Scripture... Uh, once with the madman of Gadara and once in the temple, the Bible says that Jesus encountered a man that says he had an unclean spirit. And the verbiage that's used there is used with this understanding that the way that unclean spirit got access to them was that they probably gave their minds and their thinking over to pornographic literature and then they became possessed by an unclean spirit. Uncleanness. Hallelujah. It's important. That's how, that's how God looks at those things. Then, lasciviousness. Now, lasciviousness is the excessive consumption of anything. All right? I mean, you, you just put whatever tag you want on it. Amen. But it's basically wild, undisciplined living. No discipline. Well, that's the world we live in. We don't necessarily coin the phrase anymore, but if it feels good, do it. If you want to do it, do it. Hey, some people are that way. Get over it. If, one, if you don't just want one wife, get two or three. <laughs> that's got to be a crazy man. That's all I know. That man is a nut. Because <laughs> it's all I can do to keep up with the one I got. Amen. Hallelujah. But, but, you know, in, in, in other things as well. It's just, it's just unbridled, undisciplined living. Amen. 
And, and the word calls that a work of the flesh. Then, of course, idolatry, which is basically the worshiping of idols other than, other than God, the idolatry. But here's, here's something that's so important. It's, it's, it's also this. Are, are there things in people's lives that are not maybe a statue or a, a, a pagan symbol, but it has become an idol and it's taking God's place in their life? Yes, sir. That's idolatry. Now, why is this important? Because Paul's telling these, Galatians believe, these Galatian believers that had received uh, uh, salvation by grace through faith. He's saying, you're wanting to go back under the works of the law? You're wanting to go back under pleasing God by your flesh? This is what you're going to end up doing. Because you're not walking in the Spirit. Remember what he said? He said right here, he said, if you are led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. But if you're not led by the Spirit, you are under the law. And this will be the result. Then, he uses the word witchcraft. The word rich witchcraft that's used here in the Greek is the word pharmakia. It's where we get our word for pharmacy or pharmacist. And in the book of Revelation it's used, and it means enchantment through the use of drugs. Well, when Paul used it, it was used in connection with sorcery, with magic, with witchcraft, the, the, the worship of false gods. And they would go to these temples and, 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 and they would partake of these substances and then worship these gods with all these wild uh, debauchery that would go on there. And, and Paul says that is a work of the flesh, this pharmakia. I've had people say, you know, Pastor, is, is drug addiction a sin? Well, at the very least, it's a work of the flesh. At the very least. Amen. This is important. Because, because I can't allow myself to get over here into thinking along the lines of this works of the flesh. Then he says, hatred. This is intense hostility that one feels towards someone else. Hatred, hate, should be something that you never feel and that you never say unless it's, it's reserved for the works of the enemy. Amen. One of the quickest ways to get disciplined in my house was always if you ever said you hate somebody, you're getting a whipping. Because Jesus and James said, he that hates his brother is a murderer. And he said this, the truth does not abide in him. Right? Intense hostility towards someone, often used to depict enemies in a military conflict. Amen. Intense hostility that one feels towards someone else. If, if you start feeling that way, you got to get a hold of that. Amen. Amen. You know, when, when I've seen people when they got born again and they had hatred towards a different race or hatred towards a group of people and they got born again and that stuff just went away. Yes, right? That's, that's why it's not part of us. It's not part of us. Amen. Then he says, variants. This depicts a bitterly mean spirit that's so consumed with itself and its ambitions that it would rather split and divide than admit it's wrong or give in. It's so consumed with itself and its own self-desires and self-efforts and self-ambitions, it would rather split and divide than admit it's wrong or give in. I've seen this over the years in counseling marriages. People just determined to have their way. And the marriage splits, the marriage breaks up, and there's a divorce, and it was because both of them had their own ambitions and their own desires, and they weren't willing to give. You know, you get in a giving contest, everybody wins. When, when we're trying to see how much we can love each other, we all win. Right? There, there's no room in the walk of the Spirit with, now, understand when I say self-ambition, I'm not talking about being ambitious or being interested in what you're doing. I mean when it all revolves around you. Yes, 
it's all about me. Right? When your favorite song is, I want to talk about me, I want to talk about I, right? <laughs> well, what will happen then is that person will be okay with things splitting or dividing or disintegrating just as long as I don't have to give in. I've told people before, you need to apologize. For what? I'm, I haven't done anything wrong. When it was evident they had done something wrong. But, but to apologize means I've got to walk in love and I've got to put my flesh under and I've got to crucify the flesh and walk after the Spirit. And that, Pastor, is just a little too painful for me. Right? But the Bible says blessed are the peacemakers. You're going to find in your life that it's much easier to maintain relationships than trying to prove everybody wrong. It's always better to give the wrong man a break than to break the wrong man. Always. Yeah, but after what they did, give them a break. Amen. Then he says emulations. This is a person who's upset because someone else achieved more or received more. Upset because someone achieved more or received more. I've had people come to me and say, I'd like you to tell me something. How is it that I can, I can, I can give and I can do and I haven't received and that guy over there just seems like every time he asks for something, he gets it. That's simulation. I don't understand why they, they got and how come they... You've heard people say this before. They'll see somebody driving with a nice vehicle. Yeah, well, I'm not like them. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Amen. You know, even where millionaires are concerned, I, ju I just read a book on the largest study ever conducted about millionaires in America, and where even where millionaires are concerned, of the very smallest percentage of them, something around 7 or 8% inherited their money. The rest of them worked for it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, when a person thinks that way, that's the work of the flesh. Yes, Amen. And Paul said, you'll have a hard time walking in the Spirit if that's part of your life, because that can throw you out of the Spirit. Then he says, wrath. This pictures a person who is literally boiling with anger about something. But here's the thing. They've, they've suppressed it. They just keep pushing it down. And then when they least expect it, boom, it blows up. Right? Have you ever been around somebody like that? I mean, it seemed like everything was okay. But, you know, inwardly they were seething. And something went wrong. And bam, here it was. That's wrath. That's a work of the flesh. I, I'm telling you, can I help you with this? As believers, we're not supposed to be flying off the handle. Right? Raising our voice. I tell you something, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. You have given far too many pieces away already. The Lord helped me with this one time is I sent my car in for service, and they brought me a loaner. And uh, 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 I, they told me the last time I was there that I was going to need new tires. I didn't think I did, but, you know, I thought, well, okay. And so I told them, all right, let's, let's do it. And matter of fact, this wasn't that long ago. And uh, so, you know, then they sent me the loaner, and it's going to take two days, and I'm just, you know, you want your car back. And, and I'm talking to Pastor Michelle, and, I, and I'm starting to get over there into that complaining Right? Start, oh, uh, yeah, I can, you know, Jesse says, I feel the Tabasco coming up my leg. Man, I, and, and, but I stopped myself and I said, no, I'm, Lord, thank you. I'm grateful. Well, before the end of the day, the, they called before I left work and the lady said, can I ask you a question? Might, might sound silly. I said, yeah, ask me. She said, uh, why are we changing your tire? And I said, well, because the last time you told me that when I brought it in for servicing, I was going to need it changed. And she said, okay, let me check. And she checked the record. She said, we sure did. She said, but I don't know. She said, the shop foreman 
went to look at your tires and said, call him and ask him why we're changing his tires because they're perfectly good. She said, they must have taken the wrong measurements. I said, no, that, that's, that's fine. She said, I'll change them if you want me to, but there's no need. I said, no, no you know, that's $1,000. Don't change them. Boy, I, I got off the phone. I said, Lord, thank you. You saved me $1,000. Now, you know what? I could have missed that if I'd have got over there in wrath and over there in anger and walked in the flesh. When things don't seem to go the way you think they should go, don't get angry. Get, look inward. Get spiritual about it. Because you need the favor of God. You need the, you need the, the mercy of God in that situation. Amen? Yeah, I'm almost done. Just bear with me here for a moment. Let me finish this. Then he says strife. That's a self-seeking ambition. That's more concerned about self than it is meeting the needs of other people. That's why the Bible says that with strife there's confusion in every evil work. Because when strife enters into a, a church, a business, a marriage, a family, everybody is concerned about them own selves and they're not concerned about anybody else. And the whole concept of a family is I got your back, you got my back, we're arm in arm, we're hand in hand, no matter what comes, we're together. Right? Amen. I've told people for years, I've only got one sister and she's only got one brother. Me. And I've told people for years, you know, I can say, so I can get upset with my sister, but don't you. Because we're family. She and I, we're family. Right? Well, we're the family of God. No strife. Because that's a work of the flesh. And it, it brings division. Then he says seditions. This is an important one that people don't think of very often. But it means to stand apart. Uh, it literally means one who rebels and steps away from someone they should have been loyal to. It gives the idea and depicts disloyalty. You know, I learned something a long time ago. That the, the, the people that God called me to, my pastor that they're not always going to say things that I like. Right? But I read a scripture in the book of Proverbs one time, and it says, if the countenance of the king turns against you, hold your place. Because there's words of wisdom in his mouth. You know, one thing that we see lacking in this generation is loyalty. Loyalty. You know, I'm a very loyal person. My, my dad used to talk about me when I was a kid, and he meant it lovingly, but, but it always, he said, boy, if you're that boy's friend, you're his friend. It, it doesn't matter what you do, you're his friend. I believe in loyalty. If I tell you I'm your friend, if I tell you I'm your pastor, I'm your brother, I'm whatever, then that's how it is. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. And, and when you're walking down the dark alley and there's a, tr a problem, you don't have to wonder where I'm at. Right? And I'm not holding your coat. I'm there with you. That's how we need to be. And he says that this, this sedition is a person that steps away from somebody they should have been loyal to. Amen. You know, we, we just have this mindset nowadays, even in the church sometimes, that, you know, hey, if you don't like it here, just go somewhere else. What about loyalty? What about being loyal where God brought you? Amen. And, and, and I mean, I'm not just talking about this church. If, if, if God tells somebody to go to another ministry or to do something else, well, be loyal there. Get involved. Be loyal. Don't get over in the works of the flesh. See, loyalty says, even if you say something that rubs me the wrong way sometimes, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to turn the cat around and rub the fur the right way. Yeah. One, one person told Charles Caps one time, said, you're rubbing my fur the wrong way. He said, well, turn that cat around. <laughs> you, you have to be loyal. And Paul's saying, I want to keep bringing you back to this. Paul's saying, if you get over there and start living after the flesh, 
and doing things and thinking the flesh is the answer, this is what you're going to get. Then he says heresies. Now heresy can be a different school of thought or, or uh, uh, branches or arms of a movement, but it primarily suggests a division, a faction, an unauthorized group. In other words, in, our, in churches today, we would call it a clique. A click. Clicks are dangerous. I am a click buster. I love everybody. But if I see a click starting, I'll get right in the middle of it and destroy it. Because there's no room for that. Because what happens is it's spiritual elitism. I have a revelation that nobody else has. Nobody else understands. Even the pastor doesn't understand what I am getting from God. And then only certain few people are allowed in that clique. And it's usually the people that will submit to that person. And he says, that's heresy. Not just wrong teaching. Spiritual elitism. Do, do you see how that's a work of the flesh? Be, be careful in a church when, when people are trying to siphon you off to the side and, and tell you things, and when they say things like, now, I'm going to tell you this, but don't tell nobody else. Run, run from that person. Get away from them. Because they're operating in the works of the flesh. Watch it online. Run from them. <laughs> Amen. They're, 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 they're operating in the works of the flesh. Then, let me hurry. i got three more. Envyings. Envyings is a grudge, a deeply felt grudge, because someone possesses what a person wishes was their own. Don't ever envy what somebody has. And don't just be satisfied with being thankful for what you have, although you need to be. Don't be envious. Find out how they did it. How did you do that? How did you work the word? How did that operate in your life? Keeps me out of the works of the flesh. Then, of course, drunkenness. Now, that word just basically means strong drink or drunkenness. Now, the question in the church very often nowadays is, well, you know, can you drink as long as you don't get drunk? Well, here's the thing. How do you eventually get drunk? One drink at a time. It's like the guy that went to the car lot and he stepped on the car lot and the salesman came out and said, hey, can I help you? He said, no, I'm just looking. The salesman said, that's how it starts. <laughs> right? Drunkenness. When the flesh becomes absorbed with wine, a person loses their ability to think rationally and it leads to excess. Just stay away from it. Amen. What's the upside? I've had people say, well, you know, I believe you can have a little wine with dinner. Okay, but what's the upside? What does it do for your witness? What is, I mean, right? And I've had people say, do you believe I'll go to hell for drinking alcohol? Well, why do you want to know? <laughs> because you don't want to go to hell or you want to drink alcohol? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I've had people ask me those questions. How, how many beers are too many? Well, why do you want to know? I'll tell you why they want to know, because if I give them a number, then they'll go drink that many. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, here's the bottom line. It's a work of the flesh. Amen. I don't want anything to do with the work of the flesh. Amen. I've been called old-fashioned. I've been called old-school, a teetotaler. I've been called out of touch. I'm all of those. I am old school, old fashioned. I'm a teetotaler. When I got saved, I quit, uh, uh, right? The old folks used to say, I don't drink, cuss, or chew, or run with them that do. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't run with them that do. Everybody needs a sinner friend. But they're not going to stay sinners very long if they're your friend. But that's important. That's important. Then he says revelings. This is, this is something, I don't want to say it's the most important, but it's, it's something that you would, I don't think that you would ever think 
the word considers a work of the flesh. This word describes a person who can't bear the thought of boredom. They're always seeking different forms of amusement or entertainment. They're afraid of being bored. They can't just sit and be quiet. They can't just sit and enjoy. They, they've always got to be doing something. They've got to be running here and running there and going here and going there. Revelings. In the, in the Greek, it's a party spirit. I've always, woo, I've always got to be doing something. Well, you're eventually going to get into excess. I'm not saying that you can't uh, enjoy going and doing. I like that. I'm, I'm not the kind of person who just likes to sit in the recliner. I like to be moving. I like to be doing. But understand something. When you get over here and you get over into this excess, then Paul says, now you've entered into the works of the flesh. And that will eventually get you. Well, what's the answer to this? And we'll pick up here next week. Verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not. Notice, that word shall is covenant language. It's a promise. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. You will not. Amen. And so I don't want to lose the advantages that I have in Christ Amen. by risking walking in the flesh. Amen. 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 And, I, and I've had people over the years, and I've heard it taught, and this, this is not what I'm teaching you. Well, you know, the flesh, and, and the flesh is this, and, and the flesh is so hard to defeat. And the no, the flesh isn't hard to defeat. You just got to walk in the Spirit. Don't focus on what's hard to the, to the flesh. Let the flesh cry all at once. You walk in the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Say it out loud. Say, I walk in the Spirit, and I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Say this. Say, I am spiritual. I am a spirit. I possess a soul, and I live in a body. And I declare that I'm spiritually sensitive. I'm spiritually alive. I'm spiritually active and full of the power of God. And my flesh obeys what I say I crucify it daily and I defeat it every day through the power of the Spirit in Jesus name Amen Hallelujah well let's stand up everyone I'm glad you came to church tonight Hallelujah praise God <laughs> Hallelujah glory be to God because, you know, you can get to the point where you don't even know you have flesh. You can get to the point where you don't even know you got a body. Because you're living in the Spirit. I'm, we may not all be there, but we can get there. Amen? I believe that. Well, hallelujah. God's good to us. Of course, don't forget Sunday morning. Uh, we'll be here ministering again on Keys to Manifestation. And we're believing God for some great things in Sunday night. As well, God is so good to us. Amen. Uh, in May, I believe it's May. Is Kim, I don't know. Kimberly, is she back there? No? I believe it's May. I'll have to get you the dates. But uh, Mylon and Christy Lefevre will be with us uh, and going to be ministering to us. We're going to have a marriage encounter uh, on uh, Friday and Saturday. And then they'll be with us Sunday morning as well. So we're excited about Is it May? May? Amen. And so uh, uh, we're excited about... Uh, uh, them being with us is going to be a great, great time. Amen. Well, come on, say it with me tonight. The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.